Okay, so um, our urban planet. I like to start also with a little anecdote because um, uh, just when I was born, an interesting picture was published the first time in history about 40 years ago, which was the picture of the world. The astronauts went to the moon, but they didn't come back with photographs from the moon. The most striking image they had in their cameras was actually the Earth. However, this blue planet has turned in the meantime into an urban planet. And we have the theory uh, that cities are not individual organisms anymore, but that there is a sort of a stage of cityness, and that's why we talk about urbanism, not about individual cities anymore, and about a condition of different expressions. And when Alfred and I went to South America, this is my father-in-law, uh, Kai Rosenberg, with Lothar Baumgarten, um, we felt a little bit like those guys, Fitzgeraldo, um, um, uh, who, who went into the jungle to find the unknown. We think, however, that the unknown today is actually in cities. It's this urban atmosphere that uh, paradoxically, despite of the millions of people who live there, uh, is most unstudied and unknown in its complexity. And I think we have to be very careful that we don't get stuck in the phenomenology of this term, because everybody talks now about 50% living in cities, but let's not forget that 50% are still living on the countryside. But what are the challenges behind that? Because this is only an announcement, 50% living in the city, so what? Um, so you could say, what do we actually have to do as architects, as urban planners, as designers? Because if it would be true that in India, uh, at one day 50% would live in cities, then somebody would have to sit right now on his desk, just like the desk that you showed, and design 20 more Mumbai somewhere in India. I have not heard about that. So we think actually that secondary cities are the real challenge. It is not those metropolises and this, uh, if you want so, this almost uh, competition of who is bigger. Uh, because let's not forget, with bigness and cityness, not only the advantages of the city are growing, but also the disadvantages. So with wealth and education, you also have congestion and crime, congestion and crime hand in hand. Geoff Geoffrey West from the Santa Fe Institute Please look him up. He made a very important and interesting study on that. It's the paradox of city growth. And we should not forget about this underbelly of development, which is for us in the slum zones of the world, because we think that slums in mega cities are still laboratories of change. And they're still, like this area, 40,000 people live here. And a lot of people raise their eyebrow and they say, 40,000, how is that possible? I just um, give you one indication. This is an old bullfighting ring, and the soccer stadium would maybe be that size. And a South American soccer stadium, you know, people love football there. Uh, um, um, that takes about uh, 40,000 people in easy. Uh, a middle-sized World Cup stadium has 40,000. So 40,000 in this area is actually not even uh, the, the densest way of how you could live. But I want to show you that also, because we're talking in this first session this morning about education. Um, Alfredo and I, when we went to South America after graduating in Colombia, we were somehow fascinated by this adventure of going out to some other place. But we were also thinking, how could we found an office that could be sustainable? And what we did was we founded an N NGO, a non-for-profit office, and we worked with students. And only over time, uh, universities, like the university where we studied, Columbia University, picked up on that model and they invited us to teach there, and it also led us to the ETH in Zurich. Because what we did, and I show you today uh, a few buildings that have something to do with education, because not only were they built by students, not by graduated architects, the only guys who had um, went through the whole school were Alfred and I, but also because those new challenges that are out there in the world, and this is a vertical slum, you might have seen it, there was a big fuzz around it, um, about a year ago, uh, we're just doing a book with Lars Müller on it. It's a tower in um, Caracas, the fourth tallest structure in South America, which is a squad for 3,000 people, uh, self-organized and autonomous anarcho-urbanism, if you want so. And what we are doing there is a little bit um, what uh, um, Claude Levi Strauss maybe did with his fascination going to South America, saying that South American cities are not chaotic, they're not ugly, they're simply wild. 
uh, it is like a, a, a birth moment of something that we don't know yet how it uh, will operate and how it will come out. And South America in that sense is very interesting as well because the process of urbanization in South America has already come to a hold. So in South America, 80% of people live in cities. If you go in the countryside, there's nobody anymore. People live in cities, also secondary cities, but they live in cities. Um, and this is, uh, I would say, new modes and models how people live in these cities. This is a skyscraper, which is actually the non-skyscraper, because it has neither a facade, nor an elevator, nor air conditioning. It has nothing of what you would learn in architecture school a skyscraper has to have. And this is also why the skyscraper is cheap. This is Raphael from our office, just buying his food on the uh, 17th floor. Uh, it's an anarcho community, as I told you. They have price fixings. Up to the 10th floor is one price, to the 20th is another price. They don't compete with each other. They have to carry up the goods. Um, the project on the study of this tower, by the way, is uh, sponsored by Schindler, the market leader in elevators, because they want to figure out how can a skyscraper operate if it doesn't have an elevator. Because uh, if your product is all about that thing, you might actually, in the last couple of years, have uh, studied and researched in the wrong direction. Because we say that uh, buildings and solutions have to be mass solutions. They cannot work for a, a privileged few. We have to figure out, uh, and one of the good examples is also the Tata car and the cell phone. We have to figure out how products, intelligent as they can be, um, can have a low price. How can you detach price and quality? This is still, I would say, a 20th century idea that good stuff is expensive and che cheap stuff is bad. Uh, I, I give you an example that you can find in every Linz flea market. Uh, buy a bicycle, a second-hand bicycle, for the same price that you get one in a, uh, in a shopping center. You probably get a better second-hand bike for the same price than a new one bought in, in, um, uh, made in China. It's just the truth. So uh, I think our categories don't work anymore and for the same reason also our language doesn't work anymore because people in Caracas and in a lot of other areas in South America, they're actually trying to eradicate slums and this, this vertical slum is actually a fantastic um, example that an office building, it was a hotel and office building, it is now a residential building, a school, a sports hall, it is a shop, it is a commercial center, it, is, it still has a helicopter platform, it was just used for a police raid where they cleaned the building for one night because there was a, a suspicion that the kidnapped ambassador of Costa Rica is in the building, so the whole building was raided, uh, but people moved immediately in right afterwards on the next day. So um, this, for instance, is a hole knocked in the concrete floor because for security reasons, people would naturally go from a 10-floor parking structure, which is part of this cluster of buildings. You would go down in the lobby, cross into the tower and go up again. Obviously, if you have no elevator, they go up with motorbikes 10 floors and deliver to the grocery shop the food. So this is all interesting. Why would we make a 10-floor parking structure and not use it for accessing the 10 first floors? So obviously, uh, some lessons learned. And um, another lesson learned, we are building, for instance, uh, because we're using this building as a laboratory not only to look at and to study it, but also to, de to develop technology, how that building can work. We develop, for instance, with Schindler now an elevator that works a little bit like a bus. It goes every half an hour. It's not an elevator on demand, where all the research of Schindler goes into. They, for instance, have their, their let's say, their Mercedes S-class of elevators is the one where you approach the building and the elevator already knows, oh, uh, uh, Hubert is coming, and the elevator waits for you already in the parking garage to pick you up and bring you to your floor, and then the door opens automatically of your apartment so you don't have to look for your keys. This is where they're going, but what we need is actually an elevator where you can uh, rely, it comes every half an hour, it brings you up with a counterweight, almost like a stage curtain, it, it, it doesn't need any energy, you, you get the energy out of solar panels for that elevator, and it just brings up construction materials and down the trash, for instance. That uh, demands some logistics, but in that case, since we haven't plant this invasion top down, the logistics is provided by the people. They're very excited of getting an elevator. So what I'm explaining you here is maybe news for you, but it's the normality for people living in the global south. And this is also a normality. In Caracas, 
the country with the cheapest gasoline prices, but just imagine um, uh, water is really more expensive than gasoline. Everybody who uses a car will now be very surprised, but it is a fact. And this is also where we think resources have to be studied more in the context of cities and in the context of architecture, and water is only one of them, but one resource of course are people, and this is for instance um, a map of the slum growth projected on, the, on Caracas, and an area that is marked in the city hall as Zona Verde is in reality after a, 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 a GIS a study of the whole area, the home of 400,000 people. This was only a part uh, section of it. You can look it up. The slum is called Petare, and it is growing together with other slum areas and expanding rapidly. So um, since we have little time, I only show you a few projects. They all have been developed with students and volunteers. We, we practically don't pay anything to the people working with us, um, uh, but uh, I can tell you we are, have a very closely knit environment in our office and the students who also um, were in our courses are queuing up to work on those projects because they're simply interesting because we ourselves don't know what's coming out of it. We think that architectural education should not be passing on existing knowledge because that existing knowledge in the environment that we are working in, this was developed with the Austrian Swiss company Doppelmayr Caraventa. It's an elevator in a slum zone. Uh, it's a technology that in South America is already a household name. It exists in Medellin, in Rio and other places and it is a feeder line for subways. Subways are built by Bombardier and large-scale um, uh, uh, credits, with large-scale credits from the World Bank. Um, we just signed an uh, MOU with the Inter-American Development Bank because the bank says the projects that the owner countries come to us are so bad that we already know they will never work out. We actually need institutionally also to reorient ourselves and what would be better to involve, uni involve universities, stakeholders and students in such a research and that has al also opened a, a lot of alleyways that the industry has picked up on this and I would also say the problem that a lot of universities I just saw today in the paper in Vienna students on the street um, uh, because there's no money again for, for lecture halls, privatization costs etc. Um, as long as you can maintain your autonomy and you don't deliver the services that the industry wants from you, but you use this time window which exists right now, that actually the industry has also no orientation where the market goes. And if you follow the uh, pages of The Economist, uh, you will also know that uh, third world countries and developing countries are not any more interesting as production places, but they are actually the marketplaces. This is a big change. I would say. Today, uh, in big difference to uh, before, and you can look that all up yourself, today the, the raw materials, the production and the market is all not here anymore. So uh, I, I would say there's no, no surprise for the economic slump here, because if, if you move the production entities and the market and the raw materials are elsewhere, so why would anybody have any, any job anymore, other than you're plugged into this second phase of globalization and probably the steel work of the first is not. So get prepared, they will all be on the street sooner or later and universities in the north are still those magnets and this is why this other university, uh, NYU, can go to Abu Dhabi uh, because they need the university. W where else would you get talent and intelligence? That is still, I would say, a bastion of, of Europe, of the, of the flagship Europe, if it doesn't want to be a lifeboat or a sinking ship, it's the knowledge base and the design knowledge and the art base, I think that's all important. Um, so alternatives to car traffic, uh, infrastructure, that's all um, highly relevant in these cities because uh, in the last hundred years, if you want so, solutions on that level were the, the famous analogy for a man with a hammer in his nail, every problem, um, uh, for a man with a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, it always was the car. So I think we have an opportunity now in secondary cities um, to suggest something different and something new. So this is another project after the cable car, it's called the Vertical Gymnasium. Uh, uh, we have built a number of them in different places of the city. After presenting a plan, 100 Gymnasiums Verticales for Caracas, uh, I'm only showing you a few under construction. 
and they actually multiply the non-existing sports areas, which are by law, by the urbanistic laws, necessary for that amount of people, but every city mayor would say, well, there's no free space, so what do we do? So we verticalized them, and we made a patent out of them, and uh, the patent is actually in uh, Creative Commons, it's for free, if anybody knows the site, he gets the plans, he can build the project by himself, it's all pre-calculated, we have already exported it to other countries in South America, to Argentina and Brazil, uh, they're now building one in Rio, which will be the, uh, again, a very uh, cynical situation, they have the Olympics, but public schools have no sport fields, because as schools expanded, they expanded on the sports field, so there was no space anymore left. So uh, gymnasiums, verticales, have become a, a possible and an accessible solution. A place like this has 15,000 visitors a month. I would say every uh, Landlord's Museum would be happy if that many people would float in. Uh, that's quite a, a, a number. And it's for free, uh, by the way. This is a, a sort of a self-sustained uh, structure. And uh, it's also, I would say, uh, educational. So we pass from transportation where you have hubs, which are the stations, into something else. This is a school for autistic children. I learned something uh, working with autistic children, and now I can use this board that I asked for. Uh, and that also fits to the preceding presentations. I think we all need two things. And this is uh, Simon Baron Cohen, uh, an English um, uh, doctor of medicine who works with autists, and who said, he says autists work like that. They're good in structure, but bad in empathy. And the trick is, you have to figure out where you stand, and this is, let's say, a lot of empathy, little empathy, uh, structure. A lot of empathy, little empathy. So if you have an area, no structure, no empathy, you sit in um, somewhere in Rwanda in civil war, that would be that. And if you have a lot of structure and a lot of empathy, you're on farmer's market in New York. Great place, right? <laughs> So, uh, but in reality, uh, you have to figure out where do you stand. Let's say on the boat with Elsa, you were also somewhere there. Great area, right? Lots of structure, the boat, it had all on the boat, and also empathy. But if you're back in Linz, you have a lot of structure, zero empathy. So what do you do? You have to know where you stand, and that is why I put also the picture with the, with the blue planet on the wall, because you have to know how can you move this a little bit over here. I think this is architecture and design. How can you move this dot over here? Because only to know where you stand, oh yeah, we have 50% 50, 50 of everybody living in cities. Wow, cool, huh? <laughs> so what are you doing about it? I think this is the challenge. If you stop there, it means nothing. And you will hear it and read it again and again. I think this is almost the standard language uh, almost uh, the same like you have sustainability or, or bioproducts in the supermarket. Ask questions. I think also studying architecture is being critical and figuring out uh, the question and, um, and the so what. So um, that's, that's what I learned with uh, working with autistic children. And uh, we used also an element which is the ramp that we're also building now in the, in the Torre de David, almost a biblical, a biblical name for this tower in Caracas because this elevator that I mentioned only stops at every fifth floor and the other floors will be accessed with ramps. We think also in the architectural language, the ramp, obviously a known element, can be used in much more creative ways and you can save a lot of money with an elevator that only goes every 15 minutes or every half an hour and stops only on every fifth floor. This is an, it's, um, it's an amazing uh, relationship also between the demand, door opening times, volumes of productions, preparations to load those elevators, etc. Let's say it's a completely new chapter and with that you suddenly can have functioning social housing communities in skyscrapers, but not on the green lawn, but in the middle of existing cities on very small plots. So we're scaling, for instance, this model now into a smaller structure because a, a 200 plus meter high skyscraper like this one is actually only settled until the 29th floor. That's where the weightlifter lives because he doesn't care. He runs up 29 floors every day. He actually has a gym and people do the same just to visit him because it's certainly the most fantastic gym in South America, I would say. So um, uh, we think new elements have to be introduced. This would be the element of the external ramp. External ramp is a great place. 
because it gives you in South America shade automatically. The, the building has no air conditioning. It's shade. You can walk on it. You can look in the room that you're walking into. That creates anxiety with autistic children if they don't know what's behind the door. In this case, the teacher tells them what's in the room. They go in from the other side and uh, they know what's behind the door and everybody's happy. So I would say architecture, from our point of view, is not about making a facade. I saw today also in the newspaper the standard and new building of Sana, which looks like a whale, like the, like the uh, how do you call it, the, the, those fibers that the whale has in his mouth to fill this with the water. So I'm sorry, but I have to criticize my colleagues. If somebody says this is a building that looks like a whale, that's really stupid. So, <laughs> So let's go on. Um, last project, again about education. This is in Sao Paulo. We are very happy uh, because we got the Holzheim Award for it. And um, I should use the sound. Oh, it works already. Great. Only 1% of this is true. This is really a miracle. <laughs> Quasi nessuno sa che cosa sta succedendo qui in Venezuela e per me è l'esempio migliore da seguire da tutti i paesi. I would say in my experience that there is no more important work being done in music now than is being done in Venezuela. and architecture, this is a project, very unconventional uh, uh, music project where kids out of slums are thrown into symphonic orchestras to learn um, how to play music and we're very proud that we were invited to develop for this organization a building that can be multiplied because the director of this organization, um, Jose Antonio Abreu, this is Gustavo Dudamel, the conductor of the Los Angeles Philharmonics, playing in a sort of a uh, makeshift opera house, if you want so, concert hall. Uh, they invited us to uh, develop a module that can be replicated hundreds of times in South America because they say music traditionally was f from elites for elites. It became a product from elites for the masses. This is the CD, Karayam. He, he built the factory of Sony right next to his house in Salzburg in the 70s. But today, it should be by the masses and for the masses. So if you want to do that, we need a new building where audiences and musicians are not separated, but not in the sense of Sharoon, that they sit in a circle around it, but musicians and audiences become really the same. But that requires very different buildings. They have a very interesting auto teaching method. You would be interested in it because they're using video and audio and they're throwing really, you would not believe it, a five-year-old boy who has never touched an instrument, they sit them in a triple symphony orchestra. That orchestra didn't have 125 musicians, but 375. So if the kid plays wrong, nobody will hear it anyways. So they throw them right into this environment to teach them music, and the youngest ever cello player of the Berlin Philharmonics comes out from, of the system. So I would say this, is, this has not followed the rules. This is a best practices project where 30 years ago everybody said this old guy is an idiot that will never work out. What, what the heck is he doing? And uh, Jose Antonio Abreu is proposed for the Peace Nobel Prize because music and sports and the other um, uh, schools that I showed you here uh, are not only for teaching a particular uh, strain of, of talent, they actually, it's actually about discipline, it's about talent, it's about teamwork, collaboration, and those are the values that we need, and you can teach them to anybody in the world, and we think we should not limit our ambition to one art school or to one special sector, which is you, but to the uh, general mass, which is the normality in the world, this is how most people live, to them, and this is what we like to extend our project to. I just close here with showing a few images, if they would move, of this site. This was the site of a landslide, and on this site, this is just flying around, so you see from different angles until 
this relatively small project, but the idea is in the multiplication of it, it's a vertical um, music school in the favela of Paraisopolis in Sao Paulo, um, and it's under construction right now, and we're very hopeful to see it up and running, because it is actually, um, at the end, what architecture is about, it's actually translating uh, needs and ambitions and ideas and creativity in physical space. Uh, and it's not about building a whale. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rupert. Um, it's also now it's getting more and more interesting. We have three talks by now. We had the first one with life experience of, of teaching and of learning. Then we had the, um, the let's say controversial advocate for for e-learning, and now we're coming to a, almost like a volunteer work uh, based based research. <coughs> and, and that I think will bring the arts into play in, in the next one. Um, so three very different approaches that we looked at all have overlaps. It's nevertheless. Um, which I'm curious to discuss with you on the panel. For now, questions from the audience towards Rupert's presentation. You were, thank you. It was really a beautiful presentation, and um, uh, I'm so particularly grateful that you bring up El Programa. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it, I mean, if you haven't seen the, the, the Programa play a show, I. I also highly recommend that it. it's so emotional, it's incredibly powerful thing, it's beautiful, um, so great. My question is, how do you keep in check the kind of work that you do from being instrumentalized? And I mean, if you do this kind of analysis and research in these, um, you know, slum areas of tremendous uh, um, economic difficulty or social difficulty or whatnot, how do you keep in check from um, the power structures and business interests appropriating or misappropriating and instrumentalizing your ideas for um, revenue or profit making as opposed to social good? Actually, we don't control it, and this is not because that's a decision, because, uh, but it's, uh, the reason is because we can't. Um, uh, as I told you, we try to promote and make it known that you can get the plans or the know-how or the not only the architectural plans, the entire project, the electricity structure, etc. If you come to us, you get it for free, but we, we know and we have seen that people also copy this, those buildings. Construction companies are offering them to other cities, etc. But uh, let's say our idea is open platform. You know, we, have, we don't have this ambition of an awesome architecture that's also by our office is called Urban Think Tank and not uh, Alfredo and Hubert. Uh, uh, we just think we have to see that. We, that Hand in hand with the production goes a sort of a promotion. In the slum lab that we founded in Columbia University, now there's a branch in Zurich, we're making a magazine, a newspaper for free that we give physically and electronically, everybody can access it. And we hope people see and, and hear about it because they can get for free what they maybe pay somebody else. So we don't control it, it's all open platform if you want. Um, maybe it's a funny question. Uh, I was seeing buildings so in my countries, mm -hmm. and uh, do you, can can you know how much will be cost this? Because for us, for example, they wanted to to build it in so in a city, uh, a post of police. In ten years, they were not starting or finishing it, but all the cities with the materials was was born mm -hmm. because they were taking everything in the night also when the walls ready they were taking it and all one city uh, uh, new cities is uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I hope i think you understand otherwise i, I quickly quickly as he spoke to me so i think that in this whole town if i could if i could invite Post office was supposed to be built, which was not built in 10 years. Uh, they were trying to build it. You know, I, I think there's a very clear um, understanding. You have to know your your city, the politics, the policy.
the economy of the place. If you want to be an architect, you know, you don't sit in your office and you wait that some competition is in the newspaper, but you're, you're like a street dog, you're walking around in the city, you talk to people, you figure out what you want to do, and then your client is not anymore the guy who pays for it, but the people who need it, and in democratic structures usually uh, are elections, and you should use this to your advantage, that's what we have found. And that's why we develop those projects, not with a client. We develop them and that's why we use volunteers and why we don't really make money. So you don't have to ask that question. It doesn't pay any, any great income, nothing of that, right? But it's, I would say it's very satisfactory and it's a lot of fun, I can guarantee you that. Um, uh, you have to prepare a project and you bring it to the mayor and all he has to do is to sign it. That's it, you know? You don't give it to him and to his obras uh, which is the works uh, department, Tiefbauamt, Hofbauamt, etc. Then they look at it and then they say, bring me the next set of plans, let's see if we can do it. You bring the entire project, the details, the construction drawings, the, 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 the full price list, everything, with the three companies who can build it at different prices. And then you show the city mayor, he will jump in circles of joy because that's exactly what he wants. He wants to sign on one sheet of paper and the whole thing is um, moving and then ideally, like this gym, after the foundations are done, because you never know what the ground is like, you can build it in four months. I can tell you every city mayor in South America uh, likes to inaugurate a building in four months. That's what he really wants to do. He's not interested in the building really, but he's interested to know that there are a couple of thousand people who want that, uh, that the costs are calculatable. It's also important that the time frame is limited because over time everything is more expensive. So within four months you can calculate on that and it can be really done uh, and it has been done. So I think one has to um, expand the, the um, uh, what an architect usually does before and after a project um, is, is usually up to somebody else, the client, the people who live in, in the building afterwards or however you would call it, we are trying to expand that space in both directions, before a building traditionally starts and after. We are very heavily involved in all the buildings that we have done. We go back there, uh, we talk with the people, we try to improve it. That's also interesting if you build a series of buildings, that you really have an evolution. We start with a prototype, like the brothers ride, it doesn't fly very far, but it flies, so that's great, and then we try to make it better. In a, within, the, within the problem of the politics and the policies and the economy. I think you have to accept that afterward, otherwise it would be very frustrating. Change, please. Thank you, fantastic work. Um, I just want, thinking of the image that you used at the beginning, um, the blue planet, and I think you kind of touched on sustainability a little bit maybe at the beginning, thinking about the carrying capacity of the planet, peak oil, peak water, these kinds of things. Your presentation made me think of some colleagues of mine at um, University College London in the Development Planning Unit, who you may know, who are doubtless working in Medellin in one of the projects you were describing. And a conversation I had with them, or a problem that they kind of face or want to kind of work with, is that many of the projects that they work with around sustainability in the southern world end up with a situation where people in the southern world are therefore using less resources, they're being more sustainable, and yet people in the northern world carry on with business as usual. Um, and I just wondered whether this is something you've thought about, like how, if you're using the southern, southern world as a kind of think tank or place to work and, and, and work out new ways of being more sustainable and, and critical and so on. How does that then, I mean perhaps an yeah, event like today really. is a way of feeding oh, back. I think it's an excellent question. Uh, I hope I can answer it, but uh, you know, I give you a, a, a one analogy. There's a guy at the ETH, at the ETA, Institute of Technology and Architecture, his name is Hans-Jürg Leibniz. He's a real guru and he would dump anybody who tries to explain him that leads or green building codes as they exist or CO2 interchange would be a good idea because they're actually not. It's a sort of a fighting blood policy, a sort of a thing that, that uh, is generally acceptable in the market but it makes no difference at all. In Switzerland there's a plan out which is called the 2000 Watt Society. That means that you use per day 2000 watts over the year 
uh, the, at the current rate, every person spends about 6,000 in Switzerland, maybe 16,000 in, in the United States, etc., etc. The building in this, uh, the people in this store at David, and we calculated that, we went through the whole tower, we know how many ventilators, televisions, that they all have televisions and satellite uh, TV and, and mobile phones, etc. But they, they have a full park of freezers and, and, and washers and everything. But funny enough, they still only spend 1,600 watts per person. So it's below what European standards in Switzerland, for instance, want to reach. And it, I can tell you it's very hard once you spend 6,000 to go down to two, almost impossible. You need a world war in between, then maybe you can do it. So for that reason, we think it makes no sense to explain Europeans and North Americans and build a model house, uh, a sophisticated little Bulgari jewel that maybe somehow addresses some problems for one family if you can make one building that changes the life of a couple of thousand in Islam in South America. You know, where do you have your impact? We would take all the research money from the north and pump it in the urban south because you're actually wasting your money per capita. And our proposal, for instance, is that we should not trade carbon credits between countries, but we should actually assign to every human being a carbon footprint, and then you would not trade between countries your impact. That would mean that the first pays some Ecuadorians money and they can still continue to, to pump their waste wood in the Danube and blow it out in the air because that's what they do and you, you recognize it like that. But if you, would, uh, um, if you would make it adjacent or relative to people, suddenly every Namibian would be a rich man. You understand the difference in the, in the discourse? Suddenly everybody who has nothing would suddenly be rich because only because of him you can continue spending that much. That would change the entire idea of migration, that would change the idea how, how uh, asiles, asylum seekers are seen, how, let's say, the, the whole process of industry continuing with business as usual anyways, undercutting regulations, going to the third world, right? That's what they anyways do. They're nice here, that's why it's expensive. Uh, that they can't, they have to comply with rules here, but they don't comply in other areas. We think we should voluntarily create a new project culture, and that is certainly not only an architectural project culture, but a sort of a lifestyle. And that has to promote, be promoted with financial incentives, and it has to be fun, because otherwise nobody will do it. One last quick question, and a quick answer. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm curious about. Um, uh, it's actually a very practical question. Uh, you uh, you mentioned that you share your uh, plants and electricity plants and everything. I think you mentioned Creative Commons. Uh, I'm curious how much open source philosophy um, you embed in your work in, in the sense that you let people adapt your plans or change them, contribute to your work. Um, do you benefit from sharing your work in that sense? Um, is it like an open source software that people can you know, if you if you um, aware uh, in Creative Commons, there's actually a sort of a uh, different levels of sharing. You can exactly what you what you just mentioned. You can say I share this project, but keep its autonomy, or I share it and you can do with it whatever you want. On the platform of Open Commons, we don't allow that the project is altered because we know that if you really want it, you can anyways get it and you do whatever you want. So uh, let's say as a quality uh, um, as a quality benchmark, if we give somebody the project, uh, then we hope uh, that that product is the best that we can think of. Then do it as you want. But we do look also at those other projects that people anyways execute, and we have learned from them too. So let's say it's a mixture between a feedback loop where we have to protect also somehow our brand and our interest. But this doesn't go for um, uh, financial interests. It's a sort of a quality and brand interest. If you want it and you, if you want to change it, you can anyways get it. You know, it's not. It's not that you can't do it. That there's nobody who, who sues in in uh, Uruguay a guy who built a vertical gym in the city. You know, that makes no sense. How, how, you don't even know how to do that. The, the guy will laugh at you if you send him a if you send him a, 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 a court order. You know, and anyways, not coming. So what the heck. Thank you very much. Um, well, could you be so kind and put on that um, uh, show on your computer? I would like to, thanks again, Uber. I would like to introduce.